I'm going to talk about something very topical. Does the ideal therapy become the bitter pill? So the benefits of uh, exercise on the cardiovascular system are very well established. Uh, this figure here is a very old study by Morris that showed that sedentary bus drivers uh, were 50% more likely to have a cardiovascular event compared to active bus conductors. The same group also showed that sedentary postal clerks were 50% more likely to have an adverse cardiac event versus postmen who were active. We also know that if you have a completely sedentary lifestyle versus if you jog for just one hour, jogging for just one hour versus sedentary reduces the risk of an adverse cardiovascular event by 42%. We also know that the fitter you are, the longer you generally live. Okay, so for every MET that you can exercise, your risk of an adverse cardiovascular event goes down by 13%. So we know that exercise is very good for you. It stops you from getting heart attacks in your 50s and 60s, and it makes you live between three to seven years longer. The current exercise guidelines suggest that we, everyone in this room should be doing 30 minutes of moderate intensity physical exercise five days per week, or 25 minutes of vigorous activity three days per week. But our endurance athletes exercise 10 to 15 times greater than the current recommendations. And we sometimes hear that exercise paradoxically causes an, uh, a sudden cardiac death. But the important thing here is that in these situations, death is usually due to a recognized inheritory, inherited congenital or an acquired cardiovascular condition, and therefore the reputation of exercise as an actual uh, substrate for sudden death is often left unscathed. But this is an important topic. Can exercise actually damage a normal heart? This is relevant because there are two million marathon participants each year in Europe. The age of marathon runners is becoming higher. The mean age at the London Marathon is 42 years. And mass endurance events are increasing by 5% per year. So we're getting lots and lots of people doing large volumes of exercise, which is certainly a good thing. But clearly, these mass events have been paralleled with lots of reports, he heavily publicized by the media, suggesting that there may be a reverse J-shape or a U-shape relationship between physical activity and mortality. Studies have shown that people who exercise uh, at light or moderate level seem to do better overall than people who do very vigorous exercise. We also know that after marathon running or triathlon or, the, uh, or, or, or Ironman, that if we actually measured people's blood results and looked at their troponins, around 50% of people have a raised cardiac troponin, about a third have a raised brain natriuretic peptide concentration. If we scan them, we also notice a transient reduction in left and right ventricular function. And that's led many to speculate that this troponin release and these high BNP um, concentrations may reflect myocardial inflammation that may eventually result in fibrosis, adverse remodeling, and even the possibility of arrhythmias. And this particular theory has been tried out in rats who have been forced to exercise, and when they've been sacrificed, there has been uh, evidence of atrial enlargement, scarring in the atria, and right ventricular fibrosis. As, it, as far as humans go, there are very small studies that have shown a bit of uh, calcium in the coronary arteries of marathon runners, scarring in marathon runners of the heart, and some studies have shown that if you exercise very hard, you may actually damage your right ventricle. Okay, so very scary so far. But I'm going to provide a critical overview of all of this. Let's look at the study, the Copenhagen study, that was publicized by the media heavily that said that if you exercised a lot, you'd probably kill yourself. So this, this is data that showed that if you did 1.2 uh, to 2.4 hours of exercise, moderate exercise, divided over two to three times per week, you seem to do better than if you did much, much more. So the takeaway message here is that some exercise is better than none. But look at death rates down the bottom here. If you look here, strenuous joggers were more likely to die uh, versus people who jogged lightly or moderately. But before you get very worried, look at the numbers this is based on. There were only 36 strenuous joggers, and there were only two deaths. So a pretty nonsense study, if you ask my personal feeling, even though it was published in Jack. This is, this is another much better study 
looking at a 15-year uh, it's a 15-year observational study looking at 55,000 people, uh, including 13,000 joggers, mean age 44 years old. The good news is that runners had a 30% reduction in all cause mortality, and a 45% reduction in cardiovascular deaths. And when they plotted uh, effect, i.e. hazards, versus the amount of running they did, they reported a so-called U-shape, suggesting that if you actually ran 6 to 12 miles per week, divided in three doses, at a pace of about 6 miles per hour, you did better than if you, did, if you ran 20 miles per week um, at a pace of about 7 miles an hour. But what this group did not demonstrate they did not demonstrate a dose ceiling, i.e. they did not say that the more you did, the more likely you were, you were going to die. All they showed that you didn't benefit any more if you did too much. But here is the big study. Look at this. 661,000 people studied, uh, mean age 62. And what this shows you is, uh, is the risk reduction of, of all-cause mortality, okay? So here we've got 7.5 7 to 15 minutes, which is what uh, our government say we should be doing. If you did that, you'd reduce your risk of all-cause mortality by 31%, okay? Here you've got people doing five times that. Doing five times the current recommendations reduces your risk by 39%. If you do 10 times more, you don't seem to reduce your risk of cardiovascular events. So the good news is, from this data, that you can exercise up to 10 times more than the current recommendations and not die young. And the proof is here, really, that if you look at Tour de France athletes and all the top athletes, they definitely live longer than people who don't do anything. Okay, We know that for a fact. And that's despite taking performance-enhancing agents. They still live longer than the general population. So what about the significance of cardiac troponins? No one has ever shown a link between cardiac troponins and myocardial inflammation. If I made you run a marathon and you had a troponin leak and I put you in an MRI scan, I would not be able to demonstrate myocardial edema. Very few studies have actually shown that there is any link between troponin rises and cardiac dysfunction. In any case, when you look at troponins in athletes, you find that the troponin level goes up and within about two days, it's gone right back down, as opposed to myocardial infarction, where troponin levels re remain up for up to a week or two, suggesting that the leak in exercise is due to a cytosolic release. These studies I showed you earlier, there, is, there are responses to this, that marathon runners get more calcium than non-marathon runners. Only one study. The marathon runners actually had lower calcium scores compared to non-runners. And 50% of marathon runners were either smokers or reformed smokers. They already had risk factors for atherosclerosis. In this study, which was the, they used the same, num, the same uh, group, they showed that 5% of runners had scars consistent with previous myocardial infarction. Three of these athletes actually had severe coronary artery disease and had multiple risk factors for coronary artery disease. So all these studies show you, if you've got multiple risk factors for atherosclerosis, Exercise will not stop you from developing coronary artery disease. This issue about whether the right, the right ventricle is damaged comes from just one group uh, in Belgium, where they looked at, they, they observed in 46 endurance athletes a high uh, proportion of complex ventricular arrhythmias. But just look at the people they were looking at. These athletes present with syncope, 65%, aborted sudden cardiac death, 2%, and palpitation, 15%. So they were not your run-of-the-mill marathon runner. These were sick people presenting to cardiologists who had already shown themselves with a possi possible abnormality. F not surprisingly, 58% had abnormal ECGs, and around 50% had VT. 59% showed criteria for ARVC. And based on this, the, the, the term exercise-induced ARVC was coined. But if any of you read lots, You'd have read a recent paper in circulation on 33 endurance athletes, mean age 47, training history, 29 years, training volume, 16.7 uh, hours, versus 33 controls of similar age. They showed that athletes had bigger right and left ventricular volumes, bigger LV mass, higher peak oxygen consumption. They failed to show non-balanced RV enlargement 
or any regional war motion abnormalities of the right ventricle to indicate an exercise-induced arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. The one thing that is true is that if you're a veteran athlete and you've exercised for 20 years or so, you are certainly at a higher risk of atrial fibrillation. In fact, the risk of atrial fibrillation is fivefold greater in veteran athletes than it is in relatively sedentary counterparts. And the sort of people that get, vet uh, that get atrial fibrillation are males aged between 40 to 60 years who have participated in endurance sport, who are tall and have exercised intensively for a total time of 15, 1,500 hours in, in their lives. Possibilities of atrial, uh, reasons why people get atrial fibrillation may be because they get atrial stretch, atrial fibrosis, or even atrial inflammation. We know that in the general population, atrial fibrillation is not good. It's associated with a two-fold increase in all-cause mortality, a five-fold increase in stroke, and a three-fold increase in heart failure. So far, no study has shown any link between atrial fibrillation, death, stroke, and heart failure in athletes. So what athletes are doing on one side is negating all of these risks for atherosclerosis and everything else. And whether they get, although they're getting atrial fibrillation, this atrial fibrillation is not causing the detrimental effects that would normally be causing in people who've got all the other risk factors for atherosclerosis. The biggest study in atrial fibrillation, there's only one big study that I would take notice of, is this big study of 52,755 cross-country skiers, uh, of which 10% were aged under 60. 959 had significant arrhythmias, including atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter. They found that in this group, the hazard ratio of developing atrial fibrillation was 1.3, much less so than the studies I've shown you so far, but this is the biggest study, and you were more likely to develop atrial fibrillation if you ran very fast and if you ran lots and lots of times. So in this case, skied very fast or skied lots and lots of times, suggesting it was a cumulative thing. But these studies, this study also showed that despite atrial fibrillation, the athletes lived longer than people who weren't training very hard. We did our own study on veteran athletes because we thought it was time that we did a clean study where we took veteran athletes who have got no history of hypertension, don't have hypercholesterolemia, have never smoked, and we compared them with healthy individuals who lead a healthy lifestyle, don't smoke, don't have high blood pressure, don't have diabetes. I've only given you data on male athletes because females were rather boring in the nicest possible way. They showed nothing. They showed no atrial fibrillation, no scarring, no calcification in their arteries. So the day that one of you show me that a female veteran athlete has increased coronary calcium, I will believe you that too much exercise is bad for you. Until then, I don't believe it. But this is what we showed. We showed that in our athletes, remember these, these guys were 54 years old, they'd exercised for 31 years, 77% were marathon runners, and they'd averaged 26 marathons between them. They had a Framingham risk score of 3.4. The first thing that we showed, that coronary artery calcium scores of naught were the same between our healthy controls and our healthy athletes. A coronary artery calcium score of more than 100 was the same between our healthy controls and our healthy athletes, including coronary artery calcium scores above the 50th percentile and above the 70th percentile. What we did show, though, was that our athletes had more coronary plaques than our non-athletes. And you start thinking, ooh, there you go, that's bad. But when we looked very carefully at the constitution of these plaques, we found that our male athletes who had plaques, most of the plaques were calcified. Now, you'll remember that calcified plaques rarely fissure and rupture to cause myocardial infarction. The plaques that fissure or rupture are these soft or mixed morphology plaques. So it may be that although these guys are exercising a lot, they may be getting a bit of calcium. The pathophysiology behind the calcium amongst athletes looks very different to that that occurs in people with acquired risk factors for atherosclerosis. So this is where I think we are. Exercise versus problems. If you exercise up to 14 METs, you reduce your risk of obesity, hypertension, diabetes, coronary artery disease, atrial fibrillation. 
You improve coronary reserve, you increase functional capacity, you improve your prognosis if you go on to develop diseases like heart failure in the future. You live, um, 13, your, your, your chance of anything going wrong with you reduces by 13% for every met you are able to exercise. So fitness is good. If you exercise a lot, your troponin may go up a little bit, but whether this means anything is speculative. It's true to say that our veteran athletes, some of them do develop atrial fibrillation. But whether they develop increased scarring, RV dysfunction, or coronary artery disease is still very speculative and far more large prospective data is required before we can start saying that exercise is actually cardiotoxic. Do not believe the Sun or the Daily Mail. 